Good afternoon. Um, before I begin, just a little bit about who I am so that you know who's speaking to you. As Ralph mentioned, my name is Father Joe Mustardi. There are five Father Joes now on campus. I'm one of the five Father Joes. Um, I work in campus ministry. I'm the director for the Center for Worship. Uh, I have met some of you. Um, some of you may have even been at our house for dinner at Burns Hall. I live at the furthest end of the West Campus in a house with green shutters. It says Augustinian residence on the outside, Burns Hall. Uh, Father Peter, the president, and I live together. Uh, Father David Cregan and I live together. And Brother Michael Duffy and I live together. The four of us live in that house. That's a university house that is just set aside so that the Augustinians can um, live among the students, but not live with you. Uh, so we live on the West Campus. We're sort of a presence back there for the juniors, even though a lot of them have no idea that we live in that house, because they walk past the front door, and we never come out the front door. We come out the back door, because that's where our cars are parked. So they don't really know um, who lives there, junior. By the time in May or April comes along, I'll be sitting on the front porch, you know, having a glass of wine on a nice sunny day, and juniors will walk by and say, Father Joe, do you live here? It's like, yeah, all year. And they have no idea. We just hear them coming back from the bars drunk on Thursday night, you know, <laughs> making a lot of noise, a lot of noise. But um, I am very, very impressed with the fact that this program has all of you here on a Friday afternoon for absolutely no credit, but just the fact that you want to eventually emerge as a leader here on Villanova's campus. Uh, I find that to be amazing. Um, given the quantity of activity that goes on around here and the fact that this is also Special Olympics weekend, how many of you are involved in some way this weekend? Yeah, I figured at least half of you. Um, it's amazing the the opportunity that you have um, to advance in your own understanding of leadership. Um, I hope to add a little bit to that today uh, by um, offering you some of my thoughts. As the director of the Center for Worship, um, really what that means is that for all practical purposes, I'm the pastor of the campus. I take care of all of the masses that go on in core chapel or the church or the law school chapel. Um, we take care of those sacred spaces, and I also train our liturgical ministers, those who want to be lectors or ministers of communion, those who want to be involved in church leadership. Um, we, we take care of training. And campus ministry also train, trains those people who want to be leaders in service. So all of those opportunities, whether you want to be on the service council, the liturgical council, the retreat council, you want to be a leader in uh, some kind of service opportunity, service break trip. All of those things will be enhanced by the fact that you have participated in this program. And you should definitely let us know that. If we know that you have been part of the Leadership Academy, then it really helps us to know that, that you're already one step ahead of maybe somebody else who's going to knock at the door and say they want to be a leader on a, on a break trip but have no leadership experience. Uh, you already come to us with a skill set, and that's really important. What I'd like to talk to you about this afternoon for just a brief while is what I've entitled The Journey from Discernment to Commitment in Leadership. Because I really believe it is a journey, and many of you have begun that. Um, a lot of you are very involved, I'm sure, in high school leadership. And for a good number of you, you may have been, you know, a student council president, a class president, um, in charge of various organizations. In high school, what happens is you, you rise to the top of the class because of your leadership qualities. And you end up being a very unique part of that high school class. Not everybody can be the president of the student government. Not everybody can be a president of a class. But when you come to Villanova, all of a sudden, you're in class with 10 other presidents of student council. 
with 15 other presidents of your, their class in the high schools that they went to from any number of high schools all over this country. Once when you were um, a unique individual in high school, you become one of many when you get to college. Especially a place like Villanova that seeks people like you out. We look for student leaders to come here. So when you fill out your application online or whatever it is that has those applications coming to us, all of a sudden we have a, you know, 15,000 applicants of potential leaders. So from them, we have to figure out who the best of the best are, who qualify to come here. We have to figure out who is going to make the biggest difference. So they're the ones we look for. Some of them choose to come here. Some of them choose not to. From all of them, you have opted to be part of this um, leadership institution so that um, you can hone up those skills. Well, my, my theory that I want to share with you today has to do with the fact that I believe that a lot of people want to be a leader. A lot of people have the desire to be a leader. But not everybody, everybody follows through on that. Because they don't go through this process. They don't go through what might be a discernment process. Which is, what are the, what are the things that you're going to want to be a leader in? And how do you stop to figure them out? How do you stop to decide how to discern what it is that you want to do while you're here. Remember, um, you still have three and a half years here at Villanova. You still have seven semesters left. And those go very, very quickly. But during those seven semesters, you're going to have to begin to decide what it is you want to do. And, and I think you already know that many of the leaders on campus are going to be upperclassmen. They're going to be some sophomores mostly juniors and seniors at least up until Christmas time. So it's really junior year when leadership really begins to um, surface amongst uh, the student population. Even though next year uh, a lot of what you might be looking to do, you begin to get yourself involved. So right now it's that time to begin to discern. What does it mean to discern? Well. What I understand it is, is it's, it's a thought process. It's, it's when you stop, step back from what it is you want to do, and make sure that you have the time, the skill set that you need to do it, the desire to do it, and also the, the motivation. But you have to stop and figure that out. Because from discernment, you have to arrive at a point where you're going to make a commitment. One of the most difficult parts about leadership here at Villanova is that people have too much to do. They have too much stuff on their plate. And so you ask them to come to a meeting and they can't because they're too busy. You ask them to regularly set aside a time to be available to do this leadership that they desire to do and they can't do it because they can't figure out when to do it. Oh, they love the title. Leadership has nothing to do with titles has nothing to do with power or prestige. It has everything to do with your commitment to the cause, whatever that cause might be. And, and that's this journey. It's figuring out what it is you want to do and then making a commitment to do it and having the ability to say no to something else. For every yes that you make in your life, there's a whole bunch of no's that go with it, whether it be priesthood, whether it be marriage, whether it be a job, whether it be a major, whether it be um, being the, the chair of orientation or the chair of SPO or the, the president of a fraternity or a sorority, there's a whole bunch of no's that go with that yes. That's what you discern. That's what you figure out. Not to choose is to choose. But that kind of decision making is most often devoid of any type of discernment or critical thinking. Oh, you could say, I want to be in this group, that group. You might remember the activities fair in, in August, August 28th. I remember the date because it's the Feast of St. Augustine. And as an Augustinian, I usually go on one of my tirades about how can we have all this stuff going on. It's the Feast of St. Augustine. We should have a holiday. There should be nothing going on that day. That's our big feast day. And everyone laughs at me. And they do whatever they want anyway. But 
I always like to at least make my voice heard. Um, but it was August 28th. You went into the pavilion. There was 220, uh, more or less, activities to choose from. How do you possibly discern from any of those? So what a lot of people do, you go and you sign up for all kinds of things. We had um, 97 freshmen sign up to be liturgical ministers. We just uh, officially commissioned about 30 of those 90. So the other 60, no discernment whatsoever, no commitment whatsoever. All they did was they, they, they chose a bunch of things, but there was no critical thinking involved. I'm just beginning my tenure here as a teacher. I've worked at Villanova for many years, but I be, I've just begun teaching my first course, which is really an odd course. It's not um, a, a Monday through Friday, Tuesday, Thursday course. It actually hasn't even met yet. We won't even meet until next weekend. Next weekend is the first time that, that I will teach my class. And we're only meeting one weekend. We have another weekend set aside to do some projects. But the course is called Leadership in Ministry. And it's all about some of what I'm going to talk to you about. But this is actually a little commercial in case next spring, when you're signing up for your courses in the fall, you might think it might be helpful. Um, it is about ministry in the church. It is about leadership in ministry here on campus. It is about future projection into the possibility of uh, being a lay leader in the church, a youth minister, um, uh, religious educator. But it's also about leadership skills. And I, I honestly believe as a teacher, as an Augustinian, as an adult, the only thing that you need to learn while you're here is how to be a critical thinker how to challenge your professors to continue to challenge you to think outside the box. Not to go into a classroom, sit down and take a lot of notes and then regurgitate all that back onto a test paper. That's not critical thinking. Critical thinking is being able to understand what it means to challenge someone to be better than they were yesterday. Challenge yourself to be better than you were yesterday. That's what critical thinking is all about. You need to start doing that. You're not a bunch of, um, of robots going from one class to another. Even though it might seem that way at times, you really should be challenging yourself to look at the material and say, I don't buy this. This doesn't make any sense to me. Um, I think there's a better or easier or more comprehensive way of doing this and challenge people to think that way. That's critical thinking. Making good choices is the direct result of serious introspection. Introspection is what um, St. Augustine might refer to as, as spiritual daydreaming, where you really look inside yourself and really try and understand what you are being called to do. I, I don't know anything about 95% of you. I have met um, one of the people who I'm a mentor for, um, a couple of you have been to dinner at my house, so I met you there. A few of you are involved in ministry in the church, and some of you I see at Mass on Sunday. The rest of you are all strangers to me. So it's easy for me to say things objectively to you, and to remind you that it's real easy while you're here to make a whole bunch of horrible choices. Horrible choices related to the things that you do the people that you hang out with, the events that you get involved in. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a priest and I'm supposed to. I'm saying this because as a leader, you then become a person who is an example to other people, an example of that leadership. So making good choices is a direct result of serious introspection. Serious introspection is discernment. That's what discernment's all about. It's about looking within. It's like, it's like being able to swallow a mirror and look inside yourself. What makes you tick? What is it that singles you out from everybody else on this campus? Even though you might be sitting next to somebody who has the same credentials as you from high school, something makes you different. And there are the things at an interview, when you're going to be interviewed for a leadership position, that those people are going to want to know. Even though at the very basis of leadership is humility, there's also the necessity for you to learn how to brag about what you're good at. 
You're not taking this course because you have nothing to do on a Friday afternoon. You're taking this program because you want it to enhance your skills. As a leader, you, you want to be able to understand what that is that singles you out from the other person that's going to make you competitive in the work world, um, academically, socially, and hopefully spiritually, psychologically. Leadership is about the whole person. It's about a holistic approach. And so that serious introspection is really important. Following through on those choices is what I believe commitment to be. Don't sign up for something that you don't really believe in. Don't volunteer to do something that you're not committed to. Don't think of yourself as a leader just because it's another notch on your belt or another line on your resume. That's not leadership. That's being foolish. That's making poor choices that help no one. So I think it's important um, to understand that the journey from discernment to commitment. Nope, didn't do that right. Oh, yes, I did. Okay. We do not see things the way they are, but we see things the way we are. The world's a pretty big place. And if you take a look at a map and you find the United States, we are a really tiny, tiny little dot at Villanova. There are billions of people in the world. And yet, here we sit in our very privileged world. And I say that because I'm part of it. I'm not being critical of you or me or anyone. We live in a very privileged world. Not all of us come from privilege. But many of us, because of the opportunity we have to be educated here, participate in privilege. I, I went to school here. I graduated in 1972. Um, I lived in St. Mary's Hall for four years. But I was a seminarian at the time. A little different worldview. But when uh, Dr. Bob Wicks, who's actually going to speak here in the spring, in February, Dr. Bob Wicks got up at one of our meetings and said, we do not see things the way they are, but we see things the way we are. You look at the world very differently than I do. You have to. You're 18, 19 years old, maybe some of you 20. You look at the world the way your parents trained you to look at the world, even if you resisted some of that training. You look at the world through your own eyes, through your own interests, through your own experience, as limited or as complicated as that experience may have been. How many of you have ever traveled out of the United States? Okay, better question. How many of you have not? Okay. Then you've got about five or six people. If in 1972 or 1968 when I got here, if I had asked that same question, probably the reverse would have been true. That's how small the world has become. That's how popular travel has become. That's how privileged many of us have been over the course of our lives, that we get to do those kinds of things. Villanova will provide you with an incredible amount of opportunity. You need to look at them very carefully and critically. And you need to discern before you commit to any of them if that's what you want to do. Study abroad is a wonderful thing. But you don't do it so that you can say, I studied abroad. You do it for a reason. You do it for a purpose. And as a leader, that then becomes part of how you understand the world. I think everybody at Villanova at some point should involve themselves in serious service so that you begin to see the world the way other people do. Not service in terms of charity. We don't believe in doing service here for pure charity. That's useless. Service at Villanova is about justice. It's about balancing the scales between those who have and those who might not have what we have. Or who are sharing in some of what we have in a different way. But we learn from each other. Every time I've been on a service break trip, I've come home learning more about myself, about my flaws, about my weaknesses, about my prejudices, about my inability to understand the world than I ever went on that break trip thinking I would learn. I learned to discover who I am as a person, and it really helps me to grow 
knowing that I don't see the world the way the world is. I see the where the world I am. And, and I am filled with presuppositions about all the kinds of things that we do, all the values that we have. Values that I think are, are really important for us to understand. Values that make a huge difference in our lives. We see what we are ready to see, expect to see, and even desire to see. The personal lens which we use to see our world can often be clouded by expectations that affect our professional ability to see things clearly. We all walk around wearing very odd glasses, reminding us that we look at life very differently. And sometimes those glasses even do strange things, if I can get them to do strange things. There. I was sitting in a cafe during our Pellegrinaggio in Rome two weeks ago when I took faculty on a trip. And one of the guys selling junk came up to the table and had these on, and I couldn't resist. Because they, they're just a reminder to me that we, we do. We, we see what we are ready to see. You don't want to see poverty in this world? You're not going to see it. You don't want to see injustice in this world? You're not going to see it. You don't want to be a compassionate, loving, understanding person? You're not going to see it. Because we blind ourselves because of the craziness of the life that we live. And these lenses that we wear many times need to be taken off. If you're going to be a leader, you're going to lead other people. Other people who have different expectations in you. Other people who are have different life experiences in you. Leaders need to know the people they're going to lead. Leaders need to understand those people in order to be sensitive to what they're capable of doing and incapable of doing. Leaders need to be aware that you cannot look at a project or an activity or an event or a club or, or an organization on this campus or later on and think that you've got all the answers. You lead other people into the, the work with you. Not train them to work for you, not do the work for them. So to do that, you have to take off those lenses, those personal lenses which make us see the world and cloud our expectations. I don't know what your expectations were of this program, but Ralph is going to want to know that. He's going to want to know what you learned from this program. That's why he asked you to, to, to write that little, I think it was one page, Ralph, one page assessment. What did you get out of this? Because if you don't tell us critically what you get out of something like this, well, we can't make it any better. If you don't honestly do, what are they called, cat? What are those things? Is that what they are, cats, Chris? The, the, you, you haven't, I haven't never had one done yet, but uh, I just got them in, in my office the other day. Um, at the end of your first semester, you're going to evaluate your teachers. It's not an opportunity to destroy them. It's an opportunity to evaluate, to honestly assess what you learned in a class as was presented by the professor. Some teachers have been devastated by those because people don't do them honestly. They use that personal lens because they've been affected by maybe a poor grade or, or they, didn't get, they didn't get a good grade on a paper they did. That's not the way you evaluate a, a professional person. Nor would it be the way you would want to be evaluated as a leader. Be careful what you say in writing. What you put on the internet. What you put on your Facebook. Um, be careful. All of those things come back to haunt you. Especially if you're looking to be a leader. Those lenses that we wear, take them off and try and see clearly. So back to what is discernment. Discernment comes from the verb to discern, which means to perceive, as with sight or mind, to discriminate mentally and to distinguish. My use of the word discernment is almost interchangeable with St. Augustine's notion of self-awareness or interiority. How many of you have an ACS class? All of you right now? Every, almost everybody. Okay. How many of you have read anything that St. Augustine has written? So if I say to you one of St. Augustine's most famous quotes, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Anyone ever hear that before? Okay, about 10 people. Okay, You probably all heard it. Um, it's printed on the wall 
of campus ministry, if any of you do Rui Ball, it's printed on the wall in our lounge where the St. Augustine statue is. If any of you have been in a healthcare center, when you walk in the front door to go up to the third floor, print it on the wall there. It's a very, very popular quote. This is what it's all about. Our hearts are restless. Uh, at my age, my heart is still restless. I'm still wondering what I'm going to be like each and every day of my life. I'm still wondering if I'm going to continue to change and grow into the person God wants me to be. I can't imagine what it must be like for you. Um, it's been a long time since I was 19. But introspection, self-awareness is what you have to be working on. What do you see when you look in the mirror? Are you satisfied with the person that you are? Are you satisfied? Not, not physically, not with the accidental stuff, you know, not with height. I've always wanted to be six foot two, but I was born short. Nothing I can do about it. So I go through life being five six. That's not a problem for me. The problem is when I look inside myself, am I comfortable with the person that I am? Am I happy with the choices that I make? Am I satisfied with the gifts that I've been given? What are my strengths? Am I working on them? And am I trying to take my weaknesses and spend so much time working on them that I forget to develop my strengths? You know, you can't teach a rabbit to swim. You can't teach a fish to climb a tree. There are some things as a leader that you need to understand that you can't do. And the best leaders that I've ever worked with are people who can call upon other people who might not have leadership skills, but to fill in the void in their own ability. To be able to tap somebody on the shoulder and say, look, you are really better at this than I am. Will you take over and do this? That's discernment. That's being able to figure out, you know, what it is that you can do and can't do. And so keep that in mind. Um, discernment is that which calls a person to stop and actively seek some clarity by trying to seek answers that have surfaced because of one's desire to know themselves more deeply. That's your task here. You probably changed physically in high school more than you will ever change in a four-year period of time. You will not change that radically here. You might. But you will change emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, and mentally in these four years than you will again in any other four-year period of your life. These are very powerful years. Don't waste them. Don't waste them by making foolish choices. Don't waste them by not keeping your academics as the primary focus of what you're doing here. Don't waste them by not stepping up to a leadership role that you might be qualified to do because you're afraid. Afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of failure. Failure is one of our best teachers. That teaches us a lot. That teaches us a lot about who we are and what we're capable of doing. Because you're going to deal with failure as a leader. So discernment is taking the time to think, the time to react, to, um, to respond to everything you have to do. Here's the quote from Augustine. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. That's a paraphrase. Searching for the truth about oneself through honest and open self-disclosure opens the doorway into the restless heart. You have a restless heart. I'm just telling you that outright. You might not think you do, but I guarantee you, you do. Every one of us has one. This picture right here of St. Augustine, there's one depicted like this in the church. This is St. Augustine. He was a great scholar, if you, if you don't know anything about him. A great scholar um, and a, a wonderful author. He's left us five million words. That's how many words he's written in his lifetime. You'll hear about St. Augustine off and on. It's not Augustine. It's St. Augustine. Um, and this particular legend is very popular. St. Augustine was trying to write a book on the Trinity. For those of you who are part of a, a Christian faith, the Trinity is... God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those of you who might be of another denomination, that might not be a familiar word to you. But the Trinity is part of the mystery of our faith, part of the mystery of God. St. Augustine was trying to define it. He was having trouble doing it. He couldn't figure out how to make sense of this mystery. So he's walking on the beach, back and forth, you know, trying to answer this question in his mind. He sees this little kid on the beach who's got a shell, and he's taking water from the ocean, and he's pouring it in a hole. 
And he goes back to the ocean and gets more water and pours it in the hole. And St. Augustine looks at him and says, what are you doing? And the little kid says, oh, I'm emptying the ocean into this hole. And St. Augustine said to him, well, that's impossible. And the little kid looked up and said, and that's what trying to define the Trinity is, too. It's impossible. There are some things in life we just have to live out. Gabriel Marcel, a, a famous Christian um, existentialist, said, um, life is a mystery to be lived, not a problem to be solved. St. Augustine would agree with that philosophy. We, we have this restless heart that will never be satisfied. It shouldn't be. It's always reaching for something more. It's always desiring something more powerful, something greater than who we are today. So as, as people who are now part of this Augustinian institution, okay, you want to also understand that Augustine tells us, Lord, let me know myself so that I may know you. Again, I don't know anything about your spirituality. I don't know if you've decided you're going to be a churchgoer or a prayer. If you're not going to do any of those things, most college freshmen make that choice the first two or three weeks of their college education, whether you're going to go to church or not. I'm saying to you, whatever your spirituality is, don't underwrite it. It's an important part of who you are as a person. I'm not saying you have to be a churchgoer, even though I'd like you to be. I'm not saying that you have to be active in your faith, even though I'd like you to be, because we need you to be there. What I'm saying to you is you develop your bodies. Many of you will see me or I'll see you in the Davis Center, you know, in the gym. You'll be lifting weights. I'll be huffing and puffing on the treadmill. Um, but you, you try and develop the physicality of who you are because you want to look good. Your minds are going to be developed in the classroom because you're going to be challenged, hopefully, by your academics. Even though many of you are really, really intelligent people, you want to be challenged in the classroom. But what about your spirit? What about that which makes you think about being compassionate, just, merciful, gentle, understanding? What about those gifts that, that those of us in a, in a Christian world refer to as the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom and knowledge and right judgment? Gifts that have nothing to do with Christianity, but have everything to do with humanity. They're the things you want to be sensitive of. And that's why Augustine said, Lord, let me know myself. So use these years to get to know who you really are. To get to know what really makes you tick. Because they're the things that are going to really radically help you change as a person. You know? Healthy introspection leads to healthy self-worth and self-esteem. While an unbalanced view of oneself and a distorted self-image impedes the synthesis process directing young, formidable minds to look at themselves in an unbalanced way, becoming a problem to themselves. St. Augustine said that. He said, I'm a problem to myself. Because his mind would always be taking him in places it shouldn't take him. You, you probably know that Augustine was not always a saint. He was not always a doctor of the church. He was like you. He was a young person that had um, a lot of stuff going on. He had an illegitimate child. He lived with a mistress for many years until he realized that these things weren't helping him at all. They were only satisfying the physical nature of his life. We need to satisfy a lot more than that. And that to me is where spirituality comes in. And if I didn't have this habit on and I was just a regular professor here at Villanova, I would say the same thing to you. Your spiritual life is what completes that holistic approach. So keep that in mind because you don't want an unbalanced way or you don't want to become a problem to yourself. Um, and, and if you ever see yourself becoming a problem, well, get some help because that's another good part of leadership. Amira. One side's magnified, the other side's not. One of the best ways for us to take stock of who and what we are is to be able to take a mirror and to be able to look exactly at what we see in that mirror. Desire brings us to the point of self-reflection. You desire to be the chair of orientation. You desire to be the president of a fraternity. You desire uh, to next year be on the management team for SPO. You desire to be captain of the tennis club, the swim club, the golf club. You desire to be president of student government or senior class president or junior class president. You desire a lot of things. Take a good look 
at those desires? Where are they leading you? How are they guiding you? How are they forcing you to make choices that are good or bad or indifferent? You know, um, being able to magnify the way we see ourselves is really, really important. So be very careful about that and make sure your desire is a reflection of really who you are. Today, more than 11 million traditionally aged undergraduates bring themselves to college campuses across the country. A wide range of talent, interest, aspiration, and expectation. Increasingly, they come from diverse racial and ethnic, socioeconomic, and religious backgrounds. Their childhood and adolescent years are characterized by widely varying life circumstances, cultural traditions that frame, consciously or not, how they view themselves and others in the world. Did you ever stop to think about um, your ethnic background, how it affects your choices, your socioeconomic background, how it affects your choices, your interests, your talents, your aspirations? These are the things that, that, are, that are going to be leadership qualities within you. These are the things you're going to look toward others to get them to follow that leadership. Don't hesitate to look at them yourselves. They are very, very important, and they really do help frame the, the person who you are. We, we all live or have come out of a culture, a culture that really affects us. You know, I grew up seven miles from here. You know, the world that I see is very different. I have lived in other places. I've lived on Staten Island for 15 years. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel. I lived in Italy for several years. Um, I've worked in Mexico. Uh, these are all things that have allowed me to culturally identify who I am with who I am not. You know, discernment slows down the process of making hasty decisions. Like the sands of an hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Um, an hourglass is an interesting way of looking at time. You know, it kind of dribbles along. Um, it, it just, little by little. If I were to cover the top part, and you weren't able to see how much sand is left, I wonder how different we would think of the time we have left here. Yesterday, uh, last night, if some of you happened to be at the 5.30 Mass, we honored a student who just died of leukemia, Junior. Andrew Accardi, you may have heard his name mentioned. Um, he's had leukemia since he was three. Do you think he saw the world the way any of us saw the world? Probably not. Um, always wondering how much sand was left in the top of the hourglass. Life is really short, and your time here is really quick. You might not think so today or next week or during the exam period, but you've already been on fall break. Half the semester is already over. You're going to be home for Thanksgiving in a few weeks. You're going to come back from Thanksgiving and bam, it's going to be exams. You're going to be home again for three weeks. It's not like high school. You're, you're here for 14 weeks, then you're gone. You're here for 14 weeks, then you're gone. Then you have the summer. Next thing you know, you're sophomores. And then boom, you're juniors and seniors and you're out of here. Uh, ask, ask seniors that you know how fast the time has gone. Some of you, whether you realize it or not, have already met your spouse already met that person walking around this campus sitting next to you in a classroom. You don't even realize it yet because you haven't even begun to enter into that type of relationship where you're even thinking about marriage. But I guarantee you that some of you have. Some of you may not make it to senior year because that sand is going to dribble down there and you're going to discover that this isn't the place you belong, that you need to get out of here. This isn't helping that restless heart of yours not answering those questions, you're not able to discern. And that's also good. That's also good until you find the place where you do belong. But the time that you spend at Villanova is critical time. And you don't want to waste it. You don't want to let that time drift through the hourglass as if you have plenty of it. How many hours in a week? How many hours in a week? Who knows? 100 and what? 60? 64? Who knows? Who's good? 168. Okay. How many hours of class do you have? 
15, 18 at the most. Okay, 168 hours in a week. You have 15 or 18 of those hours where you are in a classroom. That gives you about six and a half days a week in which you have nothing to do but eat, sleep, study, and do whatever it is you want to do at that free time. If you stop and figure all that out, if you take those 15, 18 hours aside, if then you decide you're going to really study the amount of hours you're supposed to, which is three hours for every credit you have. I don't know how many people, myself included, studied 45 hours a week for their courses. Maybe some of you do, but that's what you're supposed to study. Okay, deduct that. Deduct sleeping 8 to 10 hours a night. Deduct that. Uh, maybe, maybe eating anywhere from 2 to 3 hours a day, which is long, but deduct that. You end up with about 40 hours left in the week in which there is absolutely nothing you're supposed to be doing. Nothing. Those 40 hours, I always recommend you should tithe 10% of them to doing some kind of service. That's four hours. Some kind of service. Here on campus, off campus, Rays of Sunshine, Rui Ball Cove, service break trip, whatever it might be, uh, service learning community, whatever it is, four hours. Because then you begin to develop these skills that you're looking to develop. You know, um, discernment slows down the process, making hasty decisions that one can see beyond the immediate gratification. Leadership is not about gratification. It's not about feeling good about yourself. It's not about patting yourself on the back. That's not what leadership is about. Leadership has a lot more to do with being a servant leader than it does anything else. Commitment calls us to a, a lifelong term of anticipation. Not everything can be accomplished immediately. As a leader, you're going to discover that not everything you want to get accomplished will. You know, um, it, it, sitting in the back of the room is last year's SGA president. Ask him if he accomplished everything he wanted to do as the student government president. It can be frustrating to be a leader. It really can be. It can be very frustrating. But it's a very rewarding opportunity. We're getting close to the end. I just had a couple last things I wanted to share with you. We'll flip through those. Leadership. You cannot separate the person from the job. Work must be human. Remember, whatever it is you're leading, you're leading people. There's a task at hand. Be aware of that task. Don't let it slip away from you. Um, be very conscious because I believe that it's really, really hard to measure leadership. It's really hard to measure how well you have done as a leader. The only measurement for leadership is going to be the end result of what you've done with the people you're leading, of how well the task has been accomplished, how well the job, but it all has to stay human. It's not about the thing, it's about the people that you're leading. Because most leaders don't lead on their own. Well, you wouldn't need to be a leader if you're, if you're a one-man show. But you want to learn how to measure the accomplishments. And, and that's not always visible. It's not always possible. You also want to be very conscious about looking too far ahead. You know, we all carry these binoculars with us because we're looking into the future. You want to see what kind of job you're going to get, who the person is you might end up marrying, where you're going to live for the rest of your life, how much money you're going to make, what kind of car you're going to drive, all of which might be issues, but not important ones. Focus in on the things that, that really, really matter, and I think you're going to find leadership to be a very um, successful. Uh, leadership qualities cannot be acquired systematically in a coaching seminar like other forms of knowledge. This is only to expose you to the possibility of what being a leader can be. And the fact that you volunteered to be here is an incredible uh, phenomena to me. Incredible. I know so many students who would care less about being here. And yet, they think that they're going to be leaders. You know, you're being coached a little bit, but it, it's a little different. It's a little different. These kinds of seminars expose you to the possibilities, not to what it means to be a leader. 
only to the possibilities. And you want to make sure that, that you're not concealing your own personal deficiencies by, you know, doing it. So be a yardstick of quality. Some people aren't used to the environment where excellence is expected. Expect excellence in yourself. Expect excellence in others. But be compassionate and understanding. They're not always going to measure up to what you might want them to be. And so as a good leader, you quietly fill in. You do what they can't do, but never make them feel diminished because of what they can't do. And I think one final um, item, and then if any of you have any questions, leadership is unlocking people's potential to become a better person. Unlocking people's potential. The key to leadership. The key to leadership is all about you as a person. It's not about what we can teach you here. It's about what, what you can understand leadership to be. It's, it's about how you can actually look at people's potential. That's a real leader. That you can look in a room. Um, Michelangelo used to take a piece of marble right from the quarry, and he would see the statue that he wanted to carve even before he began to work on it. You're going to be able, in time, to see what the potential is in other people. And, and that's a true leader. And you're going to be able to pull that out of them, and they're going to respect you for that. They're going to admire you for that. And, and I hope that in four years, three and a half, I'm here to see some of you in positions of leadership in this school. Probably even sooner than that. But by the time you're juniors, in two and a half years, I expect to see most of you critically thinking, very self-assured about who you are and what you want to do here and what you want to do with your life. I expect to see many of you really striving to recreate this university. People think they can't do that, but they can. And every group of leaders that goes through this school changes this school for the better. I think this group, every year, has the potential to do that. Don't think you see the world the way you are. You see it the way you are. Look carefully, and you'll be a great leader someday. Thanks for your attention.